Hello and welcome to Coriolis Technologies Future of Strategy Fireside Chat. Today I have with me Thomas Masasek and Stephen Evans. Great privilege to be speaking to them both. Um, Thomas is a senior advisor to Flint Global. Um, he has a long and distinguished diplomatic career, including as German ambassador to the United Kingdom. He's also been head of public affairs at Deutsche Bank and head of polit the political department at the Alfred Herrhausen Gesellschaft. Stephen is the Director of Policy Engagement at Durham University. Um, he's also been um, very senior in the Royal College of Defence Studies, as well as having a high profile diplomatic career culminating in three ambassadorial appointments and a top job at NATO, which was Assistant Secretary General for Operations. Stephen and Thomas, it's a very great privilege, as always, to be talking to you. Thomas, if I could turn to you first. Well, first of all, let me say, Rebecca, I'm, I'm delighted uh, to be here, even though it's only, only virtual, because I, I very much remember the fantastic uh, discussion we had last year. Yes, what has changed? I think um, a lot of things have changed, most of it, of course, it, because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. A lot of the uh, challenges and problems we've faced last year are still around. Some have exacerbated, uh, which is to partly due to a, a let's say, new um, US policy. Mm -hmm. But then there were longer term trends, and some of them really have exacerbated as well. I mean, look at, for instance, look at um, Islamist terrorism, uh, look at the long term and medium term uh, challenge of climate change. Uh, we have seen increasing instability as far as the international economic order is concerned, or multilateralism uh, as such. Uh, we have seen um, tendencies of um, fissure or breakups in the European Union, and not just Brexit, but also we see that uh, groups of countries um, have uh, following or are following a different paths. So there's no shortage of challenges at the moment. I think um, I think the word uncertainty is something that's been applied to 2020 very, very liberally. And you're absolutely right to talk about challenges and just unpacking some of those. I mean, um, one of one of the big things that seems to have happened during the course of this year, and it's something that we're going to be focusing on today, um, is, is the fact that terrorism has become a problem, but in a way it's almost become a problem for a domestic economy. So it's almost domesticized foreign policy in the sense that um, a lot of terrorism is actually homegrown. And so it's created almost an inward looking foreign policy. So, so I mean, it, that is a big shift on, on, on last year, um, potentially. Well, I agree. I mean, uh, we, we can argue if it's totally homegrown or if it has something to do with countries where at least Islamist terrorists originally stem from. But certainly it's uncertainty, it's instability, and this uncertainty instability creates fears. And uh, the question is, how do we cope with these fears? And this is a very fertile ground for populists, for instance. I mean, just imagine for a, for a moment if we did not have the so-called refugee crisis, the immigration crisis, which in Germany started in, uh, in 2015, 65 million people all around the globe are uh, uh, on the move. If you did not have the pictures from Germany on your television, I think the Brexit discussion could have taken different paths. I think the election of Trumps might have turned out differently. So. Populists are people who, in a very, very complex environment, come up with the easy answers. Now, the easy answers are normally the bad answers. And it will be a challenge for all of us to really find the right answers and to deal with the globalized, very, very complex world with technological progress, etc., in a way which really um, comes up with long-lasting solutions. So turning to you, Stephen, 
what's your view on the big things that are happening in the world and how we come out of the COVID crisis? I think my starting point, my essential proposition, if you like, um, is that if you have a mega crisis, um, what that tends to do is to accelerate existing trends. Um, so um, when I say mega crisis, that could be an economic depression, it could be a war, it could obviously be a pandemic. Um, if you go back to the First World War, nothing was the same after the First World War. If you go back to the Second World War, nothing was the same after the Second World War. Um, I think people in 50 years time, 100 years time, will say nothing was the same after the great pandemic. And in some ways, when you get this acceleration of trends driven by a crisis, what it does is to take the world across an event horizon, um, to use the term that they use with black holes and astronomy. Um, but as you go over that event horizon, you go actually from an era of change to an absolute complete change of era. And we might be seeing that now. Um, what's the evidence for that? Um, well, it's very early days and maybe the evidence is a bit thin, but we are seeing fundamental changes in the way in which people work, the way in which they socialize, the way in which they play. Now, remote working is now becoming the norm. Um, people are relying much more than ever on the internet and on IT driven networking. That obviously impacts on technology. Um, it will accelerate trends towards um, uses of artificial intelligence. It will accelerate trends towards the use of robotics. Um, so we become, if you like, a much more technologically based society. But something else is going on because there is going to be a need by government and by international institutions to fund economic recovery and to drive economic recovery. If you look at policies that are being um, taken forward by the European Union, they're all about um, the Green Deal. It's all about a green recovery from the COVID um, inspired crisis. Um, we're actually seeing exactly the same thing in the United Kingdom with a government that is now talking much more openly about the green agenda, bringing forward, for example, the phasing out of petrol and diesel cars to 2030. So we're going to see, I think, an acceleration of a global commitment to delivering the green agenda. So if we are going into this sort of uh, change of era, what does it mean for um, global security? Um, I think big questions there, and I certainly don't think I've got the answers, um, but yeah, is there going to be more nationalism? Possibly. Uh, but are we also going to see greater international cooperation and a greater reliance on multilateral solutions? Are we going to see um, the inevitable kinetic violent wars, because we've had kinetic violent wars for the last four, five, ten thousand years? Or are we going to find that conflict becomes more technological in its nature? Are we going to see um, more hybrid wars, uh, more cyber war, uh, more competition uh, below the level of true violent conflict, but nevertheless um, involving using new technologies in ways that can be very disturbing and very unsettling and very dangerous? What does it mean for the classic great power rivalries um, between, for example, the United States and an emerging ever more powerful China? What does it mean for Europe? What does it mean for India? What does it mean for Russia? You know, the old fashioned construct of nation states and interstate competition. To what extent will that look different, feel different, play out differently in a new world? Um, and if we do see these sorts of changes. Um, what does it mean for an international order that put in an appearance in 1945? It's an international order um, that I based on the in Bretton Woods institutions, the IMF and the World Bank. Um, but it's also um, based on the United Nations system. Um, it's based on the UN Security Council, the Economic and Social Commission, the UN General Assembly, and all the UN agencies are working in that um, particular um, envelope. Um, it 
involves major regional um, organizations like NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, the European Union, etc., all of which emerge in the aftermath of the Second World War. Are these institutions going to change? Are they going to have to adapt? Are they going to disappear? Are they going to become less relevant? Um, it may well be that the world will start to interact and interrelate in different ways. Um, and that really takes me back to what I said right at the beginning, um, because I think the watchword is to accelerate. I mean, one of the things that we've seen um, as the world has gone through the industrial um, and post-industrial era is that change happens much more rapidly than it ever did before 1800. Um, or certainly before 1700. Um, we're now seeing remarkable amounts of change within decades. Um, so I think we can say with a degree of confidence that the world um, post 2030 is going to actually look and feel and behave rather differently um, to the world of 2019 before COVID-19 arrived. I think thank you very much because it's a very useful point to have a, a perspective on on the history of all of this and understand um, you know that these things happen in long waves actually you've got a very long trajectory of time over which we see major shifts and I think you're absolutely right to say there is some kind of a shift that's happening now I guess my question would be has is it happening now did it happen with populism or start with populism around about 2015 2016 with Brexit and Trump or is this actually the aftermath of the last financial crisis in 2008-9 where we began to see a dissatisfaction with globalization we began to see populism inequality um, and all of those patterns coming through that and alongside rapid technological change which allowed people to communicate in different ways and everybody to become an expert in some sense so um, it's actually created a new dialogue that's been there for a while and the consequences now are that, that there's, there's a, a, a sort of lack of legitimacy in those global structures, those in, international, supranational structures like the World Tra Trade Organization, the United Nations and so on. And that really does undermine national security. The nation state doesn't know how to behave in that context, does it? Well, I think I would uh, argue that um, what we're seeing is an acceleration of trends, but those trends definitely existed before COVID-19 arrived. Um, and you can track them back, I suspect, um, to the financial crisis and indeed earlier. Um, I mean, I think that the one thing that's very significant has been the way in which the global economic balance of power has, has shifted inexorably um, towards East Asia, Southeast Asia and South Asia. And that's been a trend that's been underway for quite a long time, certainly more than a decade, um, probably a good 20 years. And that is a permanent shift and that has a real impact on the future of Europe and indeed the future of the United States. Um, I agree with you about the 2008 financial crisis um, because that did weaken confidence in international financial institutions and in the whole financial and banking system. Um, and maybe it also played out in a way that was to the advantage of the countries of, um, uh, of Asia. Um, ironically, the current COVID crisis seems to be having a much more serious economic effect on Europe and America than it's had so far um, on um, East Asia and Southeast Asia. And one hopes that it actually will remain a case of so far because no one wants to see them suffering significant economic turmoil. But that may also have the effect of moving, um, accelerating a trend that was there already. And I think that we'll find that the nature of politics and the nature of political discourse and the nature of interstate relations will reflect these changes. Um, I think there will be a pushback from the nation state. Um, I think you're absolutely right. But whether the nation state is going to be the prime arbiter of the way in which power operates in, in the future. That I would question, um, because I think so many um, economic and financial flows take place um, out with um, the nation states. And there are times when I feel that governments of nation states are actually just trying to swim against the tide. They're trying to stem a tide over which they have no control. It's interesting that you mention 
COVID and the European Union, because the way I look at it, what happened in the first moment, the first shock, that everybody tried to withdraw into their own shell. You know, uh, let's uh, pull up the drawbridge, uh, uh, close the borders, every country for itself. And then after a couple of weeks, if not months, people started to realize if we want to have a chance to tackle this issue, we can only do it together because the virus doesn't stop at the border. And this is the reason why I think the European Union belatedly, but nevertheless came up with a, some comprehensive answers. And I think this huge reconstruction package, I mean, we are talking here 750 billion, um, is a good example that even countries like Germany and the frugal four, who always were adamantly against any sort of transfer union said, well, this is the moment of solidarity our finance minister called it even a Hamiltonian moment where we all have to work together. And so you can draw two lessons from huge challenges like that. You can say, okay, the only, the only framework I know is the nation state. We have to hunker down. Or you can say, no, this is so big, we have to do it together. And I belong to the second school. And uh, I think we're going to talk about it certainly later. I think um, the new American president-elect also belongs to the second school. Well, let's let's hope because um, and let's talk about that now. I mean, it's there's no time better than now. I mean, President Biden has a uh, president-elect Biden has been elected on the basis of. Um, a, a to, a, well, it's been a domestic policy in the first instance. How how strong do you think his um, foreign policy focus is going to be? We've looked at um, you know his 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 foreign policy to some extent, and it looks like he's going to use a more emollient tone. But I suspect his strategies towards China won't be that different in the first instance. But I do see a much stronger transatlantic access building um, between America and the European Union, in the, uh, in especially around sustainability. Is that something that you're thinking about, or will he well, be focused uh, entirely on domestic? No, I think let's 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 take a, a, a step back. I mean, Biden is a committed. Um, internationalist, a multilateralist. He does not share President Trump's conviction that it's a, it's the world of Thomas Hobbes. Mm -hmm. Everybody is the enemy of the other one, and it's a zero-sum game. My advantage has to be your disadvantage and vice versa. He believes that we can create win-win situation in this globe if we rely on a rules-based multilateral order. Now, now, now comes the, the but. Having said that, that does not mean that the big bones of contention, which we have had in the past with the United States are just going away. No, they're there. First of all, uh, let me remind you that Biden, who has been active in politics for half a century, is a Democrat, and the Democrat are the protectionist party in the US. What we've seen now is an anomaly with the Republicans, but the, the to protection of farmers and industry workers is figures very, very high on this agenda, first point. Second point is um, he will probably be so absorbed with domestic issues, fighting the coronavirus, getting the economy up and running again, that he will not have too much time to spend on foreign policy. On the other hand, if we assume that he has to govern against a Republican Senate majority, his domestic agenda will be severely hampered. So that gives him some space on the foreign policy front because this is the domain uh, of the president. Now look a little bit closer and you mentioned China. Biden called Xi Jinping a thug. This is, <laughs> <laughs> this is pretty strong stuff. But if we see China, China is, let's say, over the years, has developed a certain momentum. I remember very clearly, when was it, eight, nine years ago, when the then president of the World Bank, Bob Zollick, encouraged China to become a responsible stakeholder in the multilateral system. Now, one thing we can say now, it definitely, 
has not lived up to that expectation. On the one hand, um, they say we are multilateralists. They are very, very acti active in the UN, in, this, in the, the associated uh, associations of the UN, the Bretton Woods, et cetera, et cetera. But they do not play by the rules. They do not play by the rules. You have a um, um, forced um, a transfer of technology. You have industrial espionage. You have uh, nepotism. You have um, a, a very uneven uh, and very unlevel uh, playing field. So what is the trick? How to do it? First of all, I think you have to be very steadfast. And Biden will certainly be that. He will not let them off very uh, very easily, even if he speaks uh, with, a, with a softer tone. I think the, 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 the word decoupling has gained some traction in both sides of the, of the American Congress. Um, I don't think decoupling, even if you want to, is, is possible in a total sense. What you probably have to do is you have to be very, very careful <clears throat> where you are own sensitive and strategic interests are attacked. And there you have to react very forcefully. There you have to make sure that they, the Chinese companies, which have a very close link to the party and to the state, do not infiltrate your system to the back door. On the other hand, you can show that if you do trade on a level playing field, if you have a good exchange of, let's say, fin finance streams, it is to the benefit of both sides. So if I, if I may use a, a, a um, how should I say, it? a story which I grew up with in foreign policy, that was the so-called Armel Doctrine, which we used with the Soviet Union ever since 1967. We said, we have to be firm as an alliance in the defense of our values and interests. At the same time, we should always be open for dialogue and cooperation. And I think this is exactly the recipe which we should follow. And I think Biden is going to do that. So I think what you've got is, um, if you like, a instinctive nationalist reaction against, if you like, this tide of technology and um, globalization. Um, a lot, I think, will depend on the ex who actually controls the new technologies. Um, artificial intelligence, et cetera, et cetera. Is it going to be controlled by governments um, and therefore falling within the purview of the nation state? Or is it going to be um, controlled by multinational organizations, you know, the, the Amazons and Googles of this world? Or is it going to be something different? And if countries are looking to cooperate to deal with um, change, and countries do, I think, naturally want to cooperate to deal with change, are the traditional ways of cooperation within the UN system, within ASEAN, within NATO, within the European Union relevant? Um, or are they going to have to find new ways of cooperating? Um, and I think what we may find, um, looking at China, which has its nationalistic um, element to it, is a very much a, a, a nationalistic um, um, enterprise, I think, the Chinese Communist Party and the Chinese state, um, the extent to which China will try and push the development of new economic and political linkages, um, which replace the old Second World War link linkages, but to the advantage of China, um, because it will have a more of a leading role. These tectonic shifts in the world, we only can do it if we're united. Now, Europe. Look at trade. We are a world power on trade because this is an integrated policy. You remember when President Trump first threatened with the, uh, um, with the, the penalizing uh, the Europeans on uh, agriculture and automobiles, uh, a, a long procession of politicians went to Washington and was sent home. And then came Juncker, the guy from Luxembourg, and all of a sudden they started to listen because Juncker could speak for half a billion Europeans. But we are desperately lacking, desperately lacking in real power beyond trade, and that is foreign and security policy. Mm -hmm. And here, as a German, I'm particularly ashamed that we have not managed to live up to that challenge. There are lots of propositions, out, lots of proposals how to institutionalize it, but what basically is still missing is the, the will to exercise power. 
you know, we have been brought up under the American umbrella for 70 years, and that has led to a sort of general pacifist movement. Now, we have to learn, as von der Leyen said, we have to learn the language of power. Now, coming to the uh, particular points which you say, China. I think it's quite obvious that we have been some a little bit blue-eyed and naive about our relationship with China because we believe, like in the Soviet Union, if you create interdependencies enough, if you do business, you create wandel durch handel, mm -hmm. meaning change, change via trade. Yeah. This, this not, did not work with China. For seven years, we have tried to conclude an investment agreement with China, so far to no avail. So that means we have to come down pretty hard and say what we do not accept. We do not accept a telephone company whom we, whom we might need for our 5G networks, which close links to the party and to the state. Totally unacceptable. We cannot accept that the Chinese pick up robotic firms in Europe, use it for strategic advantages, and losing the technological as to China. This is where we have to put our foot down. Now, coming to the second tier, to Russia. I believe we made a terrible mistake in building that second pipeline, Nord Stream 2. Why? It is not, as German politicians said for many years, a strictly business venture. It's much more than that. It's the threat of isolating Eastern Europe and delivering them to blackmail from Russia. So I think the uh, American side is totally adamant as far as Democrats and Republicans alike are them. They threatened with sanction. And I believe we would do very well if we said, okay, even if we finish building the things, but we will not put it, we will not put it in, in action uh, as long, as long, for instance, as we have not uh, very firm guarantees that Ukrainians, Poles, etc., will not be left in the lurch. And for that, I believe we need a very comprehensive and deep dialogue with the United States on energy as a whole, not just on the pipeline. You know, on liquefied gas. How do we how do we uh, make sure that our factories keep running in the future? Because we have basically the same strategic aims, and this leads us to an area which might be interesting to implore. What is the future warfare? Where yeah. are future conflicts? Yeah. And energy might be one of them. And and, and um, I just we're, we're coming towards the end now, but but I just ask you to focus on that a little bit. Does that then mean that where Europe and the United States can strategically most connect is actually on sustainability and sustainable energy? Um, and, and that actually there's a combined strategic interest there in sorting this out and sorting it out quite quickly. So it does become a foreign policy. If you could just finish on that, please. Yes, and I'm absolutely convinced that Biden has one of his top priorities, the fight against climate change. Mm -hmm. He will, he said on his first day in office, re-enter the Paris Climate Agreement, because this is something which goes far beyond the uh, pandemic. This is a matter of survival for the globe. And I think this might be a fantastic transatlantic glue, a fear, Europeans and Americans alike work on this issue and it will have a magnetic effect on the rest of the world. I mean, sometimes it gets overlooked that even the Chinese made their first, even not very big, but their first commitment of climate neutrality. So I believe this is the central issue for the future. And here I'm very optimistic. Yeah, um, I think the um, point about who controls the information space um, is very important. Um, I have a suspicion that no one controls it and no one ever will. Um, and that the growth and expansion of information, um, a bit like economic activity, um, in the end, what you're looking at is the sum total of billions of independent decisions. Decisions to say something, decisions to publish something, decisions to spend money. Um, Adam Smith. <laughs> Effectively, um, you're trying to see order out of chaos, because really this is chaos theory in action. Um, but um, actually no one institution 
can control. Um, all you can do is influence, and that applies very much to governments, and it applies to international organizations, and it even applies to the Amazons of this world, because um, they don't actually control our consumer decisions. Um, they are, in many ways, victims of those consumer decisions. Um, but um, then get back to the whole question of sustainability. I mean, e economic sustainability um, is key, but actually I think the bigger issue is environmental sustainability, um, which is partly about how we adapt to climate change, but also slow down the rate of climate change, um, but also how we protect the environment more generally. I mean, I find the evidence that's very much um, highlighted by Sir David Attenborough and so on about extinction of species depressing and frightening. Because um, we are certainly in an era of extinction. Uh, the moment it's extinction of um, basically animals and flora and fauna, um, but it is going on. Whether it will ever be judged by future um, generations um, as being the sixth great extinction, who knows? But it's something that I think we have to worry about. It goes back to this point about acceleration. Um, we, we've seen probably more species disappear in 50 years than has, um, have disappeared in the previous X thousand. And that's something that as a human race, we have to worry about. We don't really understand it. We don't really know what to do about it. But it does change the way in which our world is um, uh, it's adjusting and uh, altering and changing. Thank you very much indeed. I guess I would just make the comment that maybe this is the next international security issue. And, and actually the answer to the, the answer or the mechanism for solving that is obviously going to be a multilateral one. Um, presumably, therefore, um, you would welcome the idea that um, President-elect Biden has a far stronger commitment to sustainability and um, a view that he, that he should move America back into the Paris Accord and so on, because this does seem to be some Something that the world needs to deal with together and maybe that's the framework for the multilateral organizations of the future. Yeah it could well be because actually I think you've made a very interesting point what we're going to see is the securitization of environmental change and um, climate change and we will start to see these issues not as quote green issues um, which if you like slightly to one side um, but as actually completely central to the survival of our societies. Um, and as we sort of securitize these issues so that they will actually be dealt with, with the sorts of systems within government, um, but also in between governments in the international um, institutions um, that are needed to deal with major security issues. So securitization of climate change and environment these may well be a very key factor in the next 20, 30 years. Stephen, thank you very much indeed. And if I just summarise um, what you and Thomas have both said, um, Thomas also talked about um, environmentalism, of course, as a as a as a security issue, energy security, um, creating sustainable development, um, and sustainability in an environmental sense as well as national security and international security issues. Thank you very much indeed, both of you. It's always a privilege to speak to you both. Thank okay, you. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Hope to see you on the flesh next year. Yes, I hope so too. Thank you. <laughs> Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.